Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bali. Welcome to your brain on birth control. Uh, my name is Meert de and I will be your moderator tonight. Um, and also, everybody who's watching uh, through our live stream, welcome. Um, so, this program is a collaboration of the Bali, L&L Magazine, and uh, the publisher Nijg en van Ditmar, who is also the publisher of the book by Sarah E. Hill, This is Your Brain on Birth Control. We're very happy that you're here. Also very happy that all the other very interesting guests are here with me tonight. And I'm already going to say it so I don't forget, Sarah's book is also for sale after the program. So if you want to read much more about on this subject, you can buy the book. Will you uh, sign it? I will. You will sign it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dare to say no, no, yeah. Okay. So, um, as you know, tonight will be all about contraceptives and mostly about hormonal contraceptives in the form of the pill. And um, as also many of you know, like the hormonal contraceptive pill, the pill, has been such a great success. I mean, I think it is one of the most decisive factors in the emancipation of women. And it has been so successful that um, doing research into the side effects, especially the side effects to the brain, has been quite minimal, um, at least to the last couple of years. At the same time, if I only look in my group of friends, I don't know if they are like, this is a good scientific remark, but you know, <laughs> I think also besides my group of friends, you hear all these rumors starting going up, you know, whether you should take the pill with regards to the effects of your brain. And we also see a decrease in use of the pill. So something is shifting. So what are we gonna discuss tonight? Um, I will discuss with psychologists, well, Sarah Hill and Estrella Montoya, so, like what are the actual effects on the brain, you know, and how substantial are those effects? And are these effects justifiable to maybe make different decisions about this pill, the pill? And then I will be joined by Ineke van der Vlucht from uh, Rutgers, and we're going to talk about the responsibility of men. And I'm so happy that there are actually men tonight with us. And we're also going to talk, of course, about this, why there isn't a male pill yet. And if there is one, do you trust a guy with this pill? And um, finally, um, we're going to talk with uh, Liliana Plume, politician Liliana Plume, and a general practitioner like the Huisarts, yeah, as we say in Dutch, Peter Funk, about um, to relay their professions to this discussion on the pill. Like, I'm going to ask Peter, like, are you discussing already with your clients the effects on the brain? Um, how often do general practitioners have checkups with women? Whether the pill is still working for them, you know, like a shoot. I am uh, gonna ask Liliana, like, you're promoting the pill actively. Should you do this when it has consequences on women's emotions and behavior? And how does this whole discussion fit within the feminist debate? Like, is it really you know, do you have to make a choice between your health and your independence? Or can we maybe align the two? So that is what we're going to discuss tonight. Um, but I'm also very curious who you are. And, um, well, normally, of course, this would be a very weird question to ask, but now I can. Who is on hormonal contraceptive in the audience? Okay, please keep your hands up. I think it's like 50% or 60% if I make a... And, um, okay, here. May I uh, dare to ask, <laughs> um, do you notice any side effects that you want to share with us? Uh, so I've been taking the pill for two years now. Okay. Uh, and actually, I think both this year and last year around like December, yeah. I do notice that I have a stronger uh, anger or okay. sadness. But I think it's also related to, you know, the winter. Depression. And the holidays, maybe? Yeah. yeah. So I, but I, I, I am actually yeah. monitoring Turing. it. Yeah, monitoring this. Really. Yeah. So maybe I'm going to take with me as a question like, okay, when there are these side effects, are there, can you exclude them completely, you know, or uh, uh, to this use of the pill, or are there many factors? Weather, you know, even maybe the weather. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Uh, there was a hand here. Um, so why are you here tonight, being on uh, the pill, and do you notice any side effects? 
Uh, I'm here because I work um, at L, ah. <laughs> um, but I'm also really interested in uh, in the topic, and I'm trying. Why is to why is this a topic for L? Um, why is this a topic for L? It's um, because of uh, I think the independence of uh, women yeah. in general, yeah. and um, and I think it's also the interesting part. Um, that we talk about men as well, yeah, and why they have a um, uh, what their responsibility yeah, is. Yeah, what their responsibility yeah. is, okay. and 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 the verhoudingen between yes. that. <laughs> well, let's go to men. I always find it very interesting that there are lots uh, there that the the age that, that there's a very different age balance of men in this room. So um, not to discriminate, of course, but <laughs> um, welcome, sir. May I ask you what brought you here tonight? Um, gewoon nieuwsgierigheid. You are curious. Ik hoor het, ik hoor het, yes. Ja. Have you been always curious on this subject your whole life, or is this? Uh, it, it ne ne never happened to me. So you never had to take the pill. No, I no. <laughs> well, I think there are no, many no, men no, with you. No. <laughs> but some of the, uh, some of the females uh, did, 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 did not take the pill uh, also, but. Uh, there happened no, nothing as far as I know. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's also, I'm going to also discuss this, like, of course, there's also many women who do not notice any side effects, so, you know, how big is this group, actually, uh, that we're discussing? Uh, another guy, yeah. So, what brought you here tonight? Uh, I'm a father of two daughters, they're yeah. here, my wife. Yeah. And I, we have experienced some, well, I can say, some side effects, yeah. I, I suppose, because... <laughs> Uh, and this is not related I, to purity? As a father, I, I was very concerned yeah. and I also work with journalists and I thought, why, why, why is it never a topic yeah. on television or yeah. in schools? So I wanna, I'm really interested in the this discussion of tonight. Yeah. Because as, a, as a father. As a father. And yeah. I, I also made some phone calls to um, uh, Jeugdzorg in Amsterdam. Yeah, in Amsterdam. youth care. And I also called our uh, general practitioner yeah. by... Uh, that the age between 14 and 18, yeah. if you have serious side effects, why isn't uh, are the, those the yeah. treaters and the general practices, why are they not more connected? Okay. When, when, yeah. you, when they have the age of 17, they can still be treated by the huisarts. Yeah. But when they have serious effects, uh, what does the psychiatrist do with these? Information, the that, that's the, yeah, the information, making the connection. Well, I will also ask the GP about so, this. Uh, so, who wasn't on the uh, the pill here? Also, that. So, why aren't you on the pill? Uh, I was on the pill for three years, yeah. and now I haven't been on the pill for one year. And yeah. I realized, if I noticed, I was way more emotional when I got off. I felt a lot more. And were you happy? More. You felt more. I felt more happiness and more sadness. And when yeah. I was on the pill, I feel like I was like not feeling a lot, like I was yeah. kind of cloudy. Now I feel like way more and I feel yeah. better, I would say. But it's still, I didn't know anything when I went on it because mm. when you're young and you start having sex, the GPA or like the general practitioner yeah. just gives you the pill. Yeah, so no he, one he told didn't, me there would be any He didn't tell you anything? No, not really. He never asked you how the pill was working through no. you or she never asked you? No, no not really. And then okay. I started doing some research myself and yeah. now I know more, but it's weird that and if this yeah. is too personal, you don't have to answer, but are there other ways now you are protecting yourself against pregnancy? Uh, yeah, I mostly sleep with women, so that's... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this would be the solution for the whole, uh, you know, problem, yeah. Um, okay. Um. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado... <laughs> I'm going to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Sarah E. Hill. She is of the f on the forefront uh, of groundbreaking research on the topic of the pill. Uh, she studied uh, with one of the founding fathers of evolu evolutionary psychology, which I think is important with relation to this topic. And she has been writing numerous articles for both scientific and popular press. And she's going to inform us all about the research she has been done. And she came to conclude, and I think it's a daring statement, that being on the birth control pill makes women a different version of themselves than when they are off it. Sarah E. Hill. All right. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for having me. Thank you to um, the organizers and to Elle Magazine and to my amazing publishers. Um, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you all today. Um, I'm gonna start this off by telling you all something that you all probably know, right? And that is that the birth control pill has been absolutely amazing for women. Right. There's probably, um, you know, as, as she was saying, uh, that th there's probably nothing else out there that's been sort of more pivotal in terms of our ability to be able to achieve, you know, financial and economic independence from men. Right. By allowing women to take control of their fertility and decide if and when they get pregnant, women have been allowed to sort of dream bigger, right, and plan more than even the most optimist feminists would have ever dreamed possible even 60 years ago. And just to show you an example of this, I wanna show you this figure. And what this illustrates is back in 1970, right prior to the birth control pill being made legally available to single women, this was the proportion of applicants to law and medical schools that were female, right? It just made up 10% of the applicant pool. Flash forward just 20 years later, and it jumps to 50%, right? 20 years after the pill becomes legally available to women. Um, and again, it's just this idea that when women have the ability to know if and when they're gonna get pregnant, right, it allows us to plan for the future, set long-term goals, and achieve more, right? And so the pill has been a really amazing force in the lives of women, um, and certainly been an amazing force in my life as well. But, um, you know, like many amazing things, um, it doesn't come without trade-offs, right? So when we get all of the benefits that we get from the birth control pill, we're doing so by making some trade-offs, right? And the thing that's a little bit disturbing about these trade-offs is not that they're horrible and scary, right? You're not gonna grow a tail, nothing terrible's gonna happen, probably, right? But rather what's disturbing is that most women have no idea that they're making them, right? I know I didn't, and I'm a psychologist, and I studied women, and I was on the pill for more than a decade, and I never spent any time thinking about what my birth control pills were doing to anything other than my ovaries, right? And that was until a series of unrelated events made me start to think about the effect of the birth control pill on my brain, right? The first of these events that happened was that I went off the birth control pill, right? And I did this after I was on it for over a decade, and I made the decision in sort of non-grand fashion. I wasn't making a statement. I didn't have a problem with the birth control pill when I was on it. Um, I was done having children, and my husband and I decided to opt for a more permanent solution um, to our, my fertility regulation that he took the lead on. And so I was able to um, ditch the birth control pill without really thinking anything of it. Right. Flash forward about three months later, and I felt different. Right? I felt like I woke up from a nap that I didn't even know that I was taking. I was exercising and listening to music again. I felt more vibrant. I felt alive. I was thinking about sex. I was noticing men. It was like I felt like just like a totally different version of myself when I was off it than when I was on it. Now, when all of this happened, I did the thing that women generally are taught to do when we're experiencing something that's going on with our body that we don't know how to explain, right? I just figured it was all in my head, right? And so I filed it away in the back of my brain as some weird thing that happened to me when I went off the birth control pill, and then I moved on with my life, right? Now, flash forward about two years later, and you'll find me sitting in a room, not unlike the room that you all are sitting in right now, and I was sitting, listening to a research talk by my friend and collaborator, Bruce Ellis, on the effects of a person's early childhood environment on the, their stress response in adulthood. And the thing that was really striking about this presentation wasn't so much the topic that I, at hand, which I actually quickly lost interest in as soon as he started talking about the research participants that he used to test his hypothesis. So Bruce was explaining that even though they collected data on a large sample of men and women, that they only analyzed data from the men that they collected. The reason, he explained, was because almost half of the women that they brought in to test were on the birth control pill. 
And as it turns out, said Bruce, girls on the birth control pill do not show a cortisol response to stress, whereas women who are not on the birth control pill do. Right? Healthy, normal functioning human beings exhibit a cortisol response to stress. Right? So hearing that this is something that's not going on with pill-taking women is kind of an alarming thing to hear. In fact, that was all I could think about for the rest of the afternoon. Right? I totally zoned out. I couldn't tell you about this paper if you told, because all I could think about was the fact that these women on the birth control pill weren't exhibiting a cortisol response to stress. And as I was sitting there and this information was absorbing into my brain, I was suddenly awash with realization after realization after realization about the birth control pill in the brain. Right? I was like, oh my goodness, you know, the birth control pill changes women's sex hormones. Sex hormones, you know, they're not just something that happened to us, right? They, they don't just influence our body from the neck down. Our sex hormones are, are part of the signaling machinery that influences what our brain does, right? We are our hormones. Our hormones are part of who we are, right? Hormones influence everything ranging from a person's energy level, who they're attracted to, their sexual interest, their stress response. Of course, the birth control pill changed me, right? Of course, the birth control pill influences the stress response. The birth control pill changes women's hormones, so the pill changes everything, right? It was after I had this epiphany in this research talk that I just became totally obsessed with this idea of trying to understand as much as possible um, about the effects of the birth control pill on the brain, because I figured there was probably a lot more to it than I ever knew. And so as soon as I got back to my office, I became totally immersed in the literature on, on the effects of hormones on women's brains in general, and then the effects of the birth control pill on the brain specifically. And I was really shocked to learn, as you might be shocked to learn, that there's been research in psychology and neuroscience for several decades now demonstrating the impact of the birth control pill on the brain. We just haven't been told about any of it. And so it was with this information that I decided to write this book, so that way I could present this information to other women, so that way they have it themselves. So now I'm going to go over some of the things um, that I found in the course of my research, um, looking at the effects of the birth control pill on women's brains and how they think, feel, and behave. Right? And we'll start by talking about sex, right? because sex is always a good place to start. And it's always a good place to end, too, right? Um, so we'll do that. Um, so the research has found for a long time now, and this is probably not going to be terribly surprising to um, a lot of women and even men in the, in the crowd, um, there's been a lot of research demonstrating that women on the birth control pill can experience problems with sexual desire and sexual function. And the reason for this is because of the hormonal profile that's created by the birth control pill. Right? Women's sexual desire is fueled by the sex hormones estrogen and testosterone, right? and it's actually suppressed by the sex hormone progesterone. And the hormonal profile that's created by the birth control pill is exactly the opposite of the type of thing that's going to fan the flames of desire and sexual function. And so a number of women, and several studies have found now that many women um, can exhibit problems with sexual desire and function because of the hormonal profile created by the birth control pill. But our sex hormones don't just influence our desire for sex. Right? There's also been research now for several years demonstrating that women's sex hormones also influence who they're attracted to. In particular, this research tends to find that the sex hormone estrogen, which again is kept very low in women on the birth control pill, several um, studies have found that the sex hormone estrogen predicts the preference that women have for cues to testosterone presence in men. Right? So testosterone are these like cues to masculinity, so things like a strong jaw, deep set eyes, broad shoulders, deep voice, um, swagger, Right? <laughs> Can't forget swagger. 
Right, and what this research shows, what you're looking at here is um, the results of a study where they actually tracked women's levels of estrogen across several cycles and then looked at their preference for testosterone markers in men. And what you can see is that women's levels of estradiol or estrogen across the cycle predicts almost perfectly how much testosterone presence they prefer in the faces of men. Right, estrogen loves testosterone. Right, and so you can take this research and make a general prediction that given that there's a relationship between women's levels of estrogen and their preference for testosterone markers in men, that pill-taking women whose estrogen levels are very low might prefer less masculine men than their naturally cycling counterparts, right? And lo and behold, that's exactly um, what the research has found. So there's been some evidence that pill-taking women not only prefer men with less masculine faces than what's preferred by their naturally cycling counterparts, but that they're also choosing as partners men with less masculine faces as their partners. And it's not just our sex hormones that get influenced by the birth control pill, right? Now we're gonna talk about that result that I was so alarmed by when I was in that research talk. All right, we'll talk a little bit about stress hormones. Now stress is something that we're all really familiar with. Right? We've all experienced it when we're stuck in traffic, when we're in front of a group of people giving a presentation, right? if you're on the business end of a, of a wildebeest stampede. Right? These are stressful situations. And when our body is experiencing stress, what generally happens within about five minutes of the stressful thing occurring is our body um, releases the stress hormone cortisol. And we tend to think about cortisol as being a bad guy just because it co-occurs with stress. But cortisol is actually part of how our body deals with stress. It's how our body copes with stress. So cortisol does things to help us cope with the stressor. It dumps fat and sugar into our bloodstream so we can make a hasty getaway. It allows us to regulate our emotions in response to the stressful situation. And it also gets our, our brain primed for learning and memory. So that way, if we encounter something similar in the future, we're able to better deal with it later on. Right? And because of this, when people experience something stressful, they exhibit this big surge in the stress hormone cortisol, unless they're on the birth control pill. Right? So this is a result that was taken from a study that was done in 1995. So think about how old this is. And there's been several studies indicating the same effect since the same time, demonstrating that pill-taking women don't exhibit a cortisol response to stress. Right, and this is something that's very significant because it's associated not only with structural changes in the, in the hippocampus, which is the part of the, air, the area of the brain that's responsible for things like learning and memory, but it's also associated with problems with learning and memory and problems with emotion regulation. Right, and all of these patterns have been exhibited um, in response to the birth control pill. And in fact, if this is, table here goes to show um, that particularly for really young women, so women 19 and younger, um, being on the birth control pill is associated with a heightened risk of subsequ subsequently developing depression, right? And these 15 to 19 year old women, which is over here on the right hand side, um, different formulations of the birth control pill can increase a woman's risk of subsequently developing depression by more than 100%. Right? And it's not just individual women who are influenced by the birth control pill, right? because each woman doesn't live in a vacuum. Right? Each one of us lives in an interdependent web that includes our friends, our families, our romantic partners, and our colleagues. And so when we change women by changing their hormones, right? Not, not only are we changing what that woman is doing, but in turn, we're also changing the world, right? And so I think that it's time that we start having more conversations about the birth control pill, right? And even though the research is still sufficiently new that we don't know exactly what the birth control pill is going to do to every individual woman, we know enough about the way that hormones influence the brain and we know enough from the research that's out there to know that the birth control pill is changing women. Right? And this doesn't mean that we abandon the birth control pill. 
right? Um, it, this is still going to be the best choice for a lot of women at many points in their lives, right? It was, the best, it was a choice that I made for more than a decade of my life, and I don't think that I would make a different one, even knowing everything that I know now. Right? The benefits of fertility regulation were so great to me during the time in my life when I needed it. I don't think that I would make a decision, different decision, but instead, it's about putting the power of information into the hands of women so that way they can make the most informed choices about who they want to be right, and about their health. And so that is my presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Sarah. Have a seat. Um, yeah, before I ask my next guest on stage, I have one question, because if I understood you right, there has been research also on the uh, you know, effects on the brains. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't come out. Right. What's the reason for that, you think? Oh, gosh, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many reasons. I mean, part of it, I think, is that there's, a political, there's political reasons for that. I mean, I think that it, it's sometimes been sort of treated like it, you have to... Um, you know, because the pill has been so liberating for women yeah. that, that it's been difficult to have critical conversations about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also it's, um, I think we've all had a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a, a, a blind spot. I don't think that it's a question that many of us have even really thought to ask. We didn't know that the information needed to be out there. But isn't that strange? Because you saw the effects and figures and it shocked you. Why yeah. hasn't it shocked people before? Is this only soci sociological? Like, we're you know, not going to discuss this because of the, f the feminist uh, agenda? Or right. Well, I mean, there's a, the other thing to consider is that a lot of the research that has been done mm. um, was uh, historically done by men. Yeah. And this isn't the kind of, um, I mean, th this is a tough, this is a tricky issue to talk about in a thoughtful way, especially, you know, for women. I mean, mm. the pill is so important to us yeah. that I think that it's really difficult to be the person who says, you know, well, you know, we're, you know, this is great and we're happy that you have this, you know, mm -hmm. amazing tool that allows you to liberate yourself. Here, um, here's some problems with it. It's, it's, a, it's a hard conversation to have. Did you hesitate to start this discussion to become... I did, know? I did. I, there were several points. Um, I, I thought of really long and hard about writing the book because mm -hmm. I didn't want to make a situation where women were feeling alarmed and feeling like they needed to run away from the pill because mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to have that conversation. Um, but I, ultimately, I decided that, you know, really this is about giving women information. I think that we're savvy enough mm -hmm. um, at this point where we can think critically about something, but still sort of kn know what we're getting into and, and make the choice anyway. Yeah, clear. Well, then I would like to invite uh, Estrella Montoya. She is a psychologist or researcher at the Department of Experimental Psychology, if I'm correct, at the University of Utrecht. She also researches the emotional effects of the pill uh, on the brain. And you're focusing thereby on the hormones, est Jesus, these words are so new to me, estradiol and progesterone, of course, which came along in the yeah. estrogen. Yeah. Yes. And, um, which are the main ingredients of the contraceptive pill. So I'm very curious, of course, in which way you have listened to, uh, you know, the talk by Sarah, like what did you recognize, what was new to you, what did you miss? Yeah, so I think first of all, it's, it's very important that the book is out and that science is, um, reaches the users. Yeah. Um, I think it really should be common knowledge that these hormones that are in the pill affect not only your body and affect your ovaries, um, but also affect the brain and, and thereby also uh, potentially affect our behavior. Mm. Um, so I think that's very important. Mm. I, I do agree that it is a tricky topic mm. because you don't want, science knows some things fairly sure mm -hmm. and other things um, are not so sure and I think it, it's important that we are very clear to users um, about these effects, how strong these effects are. Um, to give you an example, so it, it um, has been in the media that there is an association between uh, pill use and depression. Yeah. And um, it attracted a lot of attention, and I mean, that makes perfectly sense that it mm -hmm. does, because it's, um, it's kind of alarming, but at the same time, um, 
uh, research did not find that, um, or the research is not um, saying that the pill causes depression. So there's there's a lack of causal evidence. There's a lot of correlational evidence, mm -hmm. so showing a relationship between pill use and depression. Yeah. But there's studies lacking that actually show a causal effect of the pill on depression. Um, so. I think is this also because there are also so many different factors that could also influence whether you know a mm -hmm. woman gets a depression mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, so there are a lot of factors uh, involved, and not only hormones, but also mm -hmm. environmental factors, genetics, mm -hmm. the list goes on. Um, so th the question is also what is the um, uh, contribution of hormones? Yeah to that, to, to depression. Um, but I also think that um, uh, the causal evidence is lacking because it's difficult research to do. Why <laughs> because, is that? Well, because um, causal evidence is, is um, given by placebo-controlled trials. Mm. So you have to, to give women also placebo. So some mm. women uh, give, uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so you can, it's yeah. not hard to imagine that that is very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so there, there's also, there yeah. are studies um, and uh, there also, I think, have been uh, pregnancies in those studies because it's, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, so that is, that yeah. is why this, the, the evidence is lacking. But it's so important that users mm. um, realize that so that still we are not com entirely sure that it is the pill that causes depression. It could also be that uh, users, that um, that women that, that use the pill mm. also have uh, uh, other features mm other characteristics, personalities, that make them more uh, sensitive to developing depression. So if we go to uh, uh, all the, the effects you discussed. So mm -hmm. the first one was uh, the effect on your uh, lust, or like mm -hmm. your appetite for sex. Uh, do you uh, do you agree, mm -hmm. but is this also something you uh, encounter in your research? So I, I, I did not perform research in this specific uh, mm. uh, field, but I know that there's uh, a lot of research mm. showing that there's loss of uh, sex drive yeah. uh, when women use the pill. And um, you also see that what Sarah shows about these hormones is that all of the hormones that, that drive uh, uh, sexual motivation, yeah. such as testosterone and estradiol, are decreased. And um, there's also a lot of animal research that shows that these hormones are quite important for uh, our sex drive. Yeah. At the same time, there have been studies showing that um, oral contraceptives also have a positive effect on sex drive. So, and I think that's also with depression, there's also always two sides. Yeah. So um, there has been evidence showing positive effects of the pill, but there's also evidence showing negative effects of the pill. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we know now is that there are different type of uh, groups, different type of women. Mm -hmm. So some women tend to respond positively. Some uh, mm -hmm. women tend to uh, respond negatively. And right now the science is not capable of, of telling us who those women are, like what mm -hmm. are the factors that make some uh, type of uh, some women more sensitive and other women um, yeah. not so sensitive or even um, um, you know that they experience positive effects. Yeah, yeah I want to discuss that, uh, but I will do that later. But uh, when I'm hearing this, so it gives a lot of responsibility actually to women themselves mm -hmm. to really notice, yeah. you know, if they experience changes in their feelings and behavior, etc. Um, and then this thing with your preference for men, because I was watching this and I thought a little bit like, well, who cares, you know, like, do we need only women going for men with lots of testosterone, you know, is this such a, or you know what, what is, why is this a negative side effect? I didn't, I didn't say that it was oh, a negative okay, side okay. effect. Oh, okay, okay, it's just a side effect, okay. No, it just said it was an effect. Yeah. <laughs> do you, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it was like it was like use of sex appetite, depression, and this. So I thought it was kind of in a, you know. Well, no, it's just it's just about it's, it's about what you're prioritizing and your choice of partners. And actually, it's really interesting because 
And this, this is from, again, you know, the, this research, um, the, the overwhelming amount of research minus the animal research that I discuss in the book is done um, cross-sectionally, like you were saying. It's, um, so this is, you know, correlational. There's not a smoking gun. Um, but again, th those types of t studies are incredibly difficult to do because you're basically, you know, there's a placebo issue and then there's also, you're making decisions about somebody's fertility regulation, which mm -hmm. is not something that we generally like to hand over to other people. Yeah. Um, and so it makes the research um, difficult to do experimentally. But with you know this research, they found that women who choose their partners when they're um, on the pill yeah. are actually more satisfied, for example, with their partner's um, financial investments in mm -hmm. them. And also they're less, the divorce rate's lower, right? So they might be queuing in on different things and um, that might be a positive. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't about like the birth control pill is going to, you know, is associated with all of these million, you know, terrible outcomes. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's here's what we know about some of the things that are associated with birth yeah. control pill use. You should take this information and use it to better understand your own experiences and then also make more informed choices and, and understand what the different trade offs are. Know what to look out for. Yeah. So then we had this, then we had this depression, but also this thing with stress. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very alarming. Uh, well, first I thought that, well, cortisol is a bad thing, right? So maybe it's good you don't have it. But then you explained, well, we need yeah. cortisol, you know. Um, am I missed? Are there also other side effects that you haven't been discussing that you know of? Oh, I think, first of all, the, the cortisol effect. Yeah. Um, I think that is one of the most, like the strongest effects mm. that we see currently yeah. in the literature, in the scientific literature. Um, but we, it's difficult how to interpret it because we're not sure what it, what it does, basically. We know that women have a decreased cortisol response and like Sarah explained, cortisol is important. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's, all, there's no evidence that women experience stress differently. No. They don't feel more stressed, right? They don't. So what does it mean in terms of their, their experiences? Um, what kind of consequences does it have for memory, emotional memory, like you also explained? So right now, some effects that we observe in the literature mm. are also difficult to interpret. Mm. And that, I think, is also very important to communicate. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, we can show these effects, but also what do they mean for, for women on, in, in, yeah. a daily, in their daily lives? And that is one of the most difficult questions for science in general, yeah. <laughs> because we tend to do studies in the lab. Mm. Um, but yeah. So. Because there are, there are also so many women who don't experience any side effects. Mm -hmm. And, well, I think I'm one of them, and I can't help but think all the time, like, do I, or, you know, am I missing something out here? Um, so is it, is it also a big possibility that, that you, have, you have all these effects, you just don't notice them, because there may be, um, how do you say that? Small, or, you know, they are so mm -hmm, intertwined mm -hmm. with all different... Well, I think it makes sense that a lot of the effects of, of hormones are not consciously experienced. We mm -hmm. see that actually a lot also in, in, in uh, our studies, is that when we administer hormones, mm -hmm. so we give uh, we, uh, women, for example, or men, we give them a dose of, of, of a hormone, mm -hmm. um, we see effects on, on their uh, behavior, but we do not necessarily uh, observe effects uh, on the subjective level. So mm -hmm. when they report, for example, when they have to report subjectively how they feel, we don't see any effects. And that is how these hormones work. They work, um, you can feel, I think, quite as yourself or uh, like normal in a way, but still these hormones can affect your behavior. So it's quite difficult to predict also. Yeah, what, right. what yeah it's, it's, it's hard for our brain to think about itself. Yeah. Like it can't do it very well yeah. because it's like it's, it's it's like the hormones are influencing what the brain is doing and it can't like sort of reflect on that. It, yeah. It's just it feels like you yeah. and then and then and yeah, it's which, which makes it tricky. And yeah, and it, it shows I think how complex this mm -hmm. is, you know, that that there's this within the research, you know, on some women it has a negative effect, some positive and then you cannot reflect on your own brain is then quitting, and I don't mean forever, but for maybe, you know, uh, sick, because you felt all these different things already after a couple of months. Is that then the best thing you can do to realize the differences, to notice it maybe better, or? 
<laughs> so I, I don't, I definitely, based on the science that's, that's out there, I would not recommend quitting. Okay. Um, but I do recommend uh, a critical attitude towards uh, your or contraceptive use. Yeah. And that, for example, means that you, um, when you don't feel well on a certain or a contraceptive type, try out different formulas, um, uh, discuss with your GP, um, what are the other options. Um, yeah, because let's talk about the other options. Um, um, like besides a condom use mm -hmm. and, you know, checking your ovary, how is it? it? Your, um, your cycle. Uh, your yeah. cycle, uh, because I think we can agree on that is not... 100% safe people mm -hmm. to do that. Um, sorry, this was my own opinion. <laughs> um, but if you, <laughs> if you have no, but it's because people do that to get pregnant, you know, to know when they when they are most, you know. Anyhow, uh, when we talk about um, you know the um, what are the good English words? The sp you know the sp spirals, the the the, the IUD. The yeah, the IUD. Yeah. yeah. So because I've always heard there are less hormones, you know, in mm -hmm. the. Is that true? Like what are what? Um, like the the IUD um, yeah. like has lower levels of hormones in it than yeah. a lot of the oral contraceptives yeah. do. But a thing that I hear from women that their doctors are telling them that. Um, it's, it won't be influencing their brain or it won't be influencing how they feel psychologically because the effects are quote unquote local. Yeah. Um, and there's no such thing as a localized hormonal effect. No. It's like, like it, there is no such thing as a local hormonal effect. Um, it always, the way that it actually suppresses your period is by acting on the hypothalamus, which is in the brain. And so um, there's no way that it works that way. No. And so um, I've, had, I've had many women um, that I've talked to in the sort of, you know, as I've gone through with the book, um, whose doctors made them feel like they were losing their mind because they were experiencing some psychological side effects and their doctor was telling them. And, and this isn't most doctors. Most doctors are not these women's do doctors, thankfully. Um, but some women's doctors are telling them this misinformation. And, and then it, lend, you know, it ends up with the women blaming themselves for how they're feeling, and, um, mm -hmm. and which you know, isn't good for anybody. So with regard to the hormone story, it doesn't really matter if you take the pill or the UG. Right. No, no matter. I mean, if, if it's hormonal, I mean, it, like with hormones, you know, no matter where you put it into your body, if you put it on a patch, if you have a vaginal yeah. ring, if you have an IUD, they all end up in the same place yeah. um, and the place is everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, yeah. so um, that's, uh, you know, that's the way that they work. Like hormonally, there is there's a, a big difference in uh, oral contraceptives, at least in the Netherlands, I think also in the US, are often combined oral contraceptives. So they consist of estradiol and progesterone, yeah. um, which is also the most popular one uh, prescribed in the Netherlands. And when you when you have this intrauterine device, yeah. um, it usually consists only of progesterone. Oh. And I think, Right now, uh, we don't know whether the side effects um, uh, experienced are different, but there's some evidence that actually this progesterone might be quite important yes. mm -hmm. and might be um, making, um, so there's research showing that um, uh, women that use that device, they have um, actually increased uh, stress reactions, increased stress reactivity, yeah. and also might be more vulnerable to developing depression. So right mm -hmm. now, one of the, the main questions is also, what are the effects of, of the intrauterine device and yeah. how do these uh, differ f from oral contraceptives? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To even make it more to complex, even make to, it more, yeah, more to make your choice. Then I've also heard something that instead of quitting hormones, to take like even more in, in the re like adding testosterone to the pill hmm. to you know kind of even this out. Is this happening already? What are your thoughts on that? I see your face is not looking very <laughs> positive. Well, no, so, so one of the things that the birth control pill does is it increases these levels of sex hormone, the sex hormone binding globulins. And, um, and they're, they're, they're elevated to such a degree that I don't think, I think that if you add testosterone into the mix, yeah. that, it, that it's just going to get bound. And when you have a binding globulin, it just takes something and it makes it inactive, right? Mm -hmm. It makes it like non-alcoholic beer, right? It's like... You have the hormone there, but it's not going to do anything, 
right? Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that sort of an effect. Like, I, don't, I don't think that it would actually end up having the effect that we wanted it to. Mm. Instead, it could just be androgenic, so it could have you know, these unpleasant side effects. Um, that, that, you know, a lot of these um, uh, birth control pills, especially the first and second generation progestins, they have different types of synthetic progesterone in birth control pills, which you might not know. There's four different generations of them. Um, and the first and second generation are androgenic, and so they stimulate testosterone receptors. And this is why some women have problems with these in terms of breakouts, or they get hair growing in places that they don't want hair growing. And, um, and so, you know, you already get some sort of and androgenizing um, properties with some of these birth control pills, and that doesn't really seem to really be doing the trick. I mean, mm -hmm. women's sexual desire is incredibly complicated, mm -hmm. and it's not just as simple as sprinkle a little bit of, you know, testosterone here or sprinkle <laughs> a little estradiol there. It's like this incredibly complicated web of, you know, things that goes on with, with our neurotransmitter systems and our hormone systems. and. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to, you know, sort of fix it by sprinkling some testosterone, I don't think it's going to solve the problem. You agree? I agree. Um, and I think also that, you know, hormones, they, they work non-selectively. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem, I think. So any hormonal contraceptive, yeah. whether, you know, it includes testosterone, whether it, it will also act on things that you don't want. And I think that is the most important um, Thing, but I also think that maybe because right now there is a considerable testosterone loss. Mm -hmm. There's like a 60% decrease of testosterone, which mm -hmm. is substantial. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I am curious mm -hmm. about you know how does this pill work and um, can it compensate for the testosterone yeah. loss and um, how do women um, uh, experience this pill? And I think right now it's being tested. Okay. Um, also, so maybe we will hear more in, yeah. about it in the future. Um, to kind of conclude, I mean, you've showed very well how, how, how complex and difficult this is and how important it is to inform you yourself very well. And then maybe still it's hard to make uh, the decision for yourself. But because also so many women are uh, uh, stopping with the pill, we're going to discuss later why, but... Uh, it's also because of course they read a lot. Are there also some kind of fables, like non, really non-scientifically proven facts that you know encounter a lot of the times that you can hereby say, like, well, okay, this is not an effect of the pill, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. I can't think of it. I feel like I'm, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, surely there's, um, you know, there's uh, urban legends with the birth control pill. I think actually right now it's more important to talk about the facts, yeah. what we do know, yeah. and it's actually quite tricky to yeah. speculate about other effects that might not even be happening, right? Yeah. So I think let's stick yeah. to what we know yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, what science tells yeah. us. Yeah, I, it, I, oh, oh, no, no, no. I was just, just going to say that, you know, just sort of to echo that point, I mean, the... the we kind of have some ideas, you know, as you were saying, that when you have a hormone in your body, it's going to influence every cell in your body that has a receptor for that hormone, right? It's non-targeted. It influences systems from top to bottom. Um, you know, there's cells that have receptors for women's sex hormones all over the place. And it's because our bodies require so many workarounds for pregnancy that our immune system, our circulatory system, our digestive system, our brain, all of these things are sensitive to our levels of sex hormones, right? And so when we change the sex hormones, um, it's going to influence all of these different systems. Um, and each one of us is a little bit different from one another. Yeah. And, um, and, and there's so many, there's almost a hundred different formulations of birth control that are out there. Yeah. And so you can imagine that it gets very complex in terms of like being able to make good predictions yeah. about who's gonna respond which way to what pill. Yeah. And we don't, I mean, I don't think that we've even begun to scratch the surface in terms of the different range of effects that women can experience just because it, it's, there's so much heterogeneity in women and then the pills that they're taking yeah. and then the way that they respond to them. Because each one of us has different numbers of receptors for sex hormones. Each one of us had a different level of hormones that we started with before we started hormonal contraception. Yeah. And so all of that is going to influence like whether we experience these effects, the, the range of the effects. And given that there's receptors for these hormones all over the place in the body, you know, which of these systems are going to be most influenced or not? 
not? Yeah. And it's like there's so many question marks that we just don't have answers to yet. Yeah, there are a lot of question marks. I, and my last question for the two of you then is um, because, of course, we're talking about birth control, but there are also other reasons why women take the pill. Mm -hmm you know, to uh, control their kind of their periods or because they have hairy, heavy acne or to make it very personal. I wanted to quit, but then it, I found out that my migraines are, you know, uh, worse and they come more often when I'm off the pill. So I decided not to go off the pill. Um, yeah, what is, I mean, not to make it personal that if you think I'm doing the right thing, but how do you think of women, you know, using it for other stuff than birth control considering the consequences? I mean, for me, I think that I think that's amazing. I think it is so amazing to be alive in a time when we have access to medications that allow us to feel like the version of ourselves that we want to be. And if it's working for you, then that's the only data point that you need. Um, you know, I think each one of us needs to sort of understand like what's possible, be able to monitor ourselves, and then make a decision for what's going to work for us and what's not going to work for us. But then I'm going to make it personal again because I'm going to understand you're not going to judge me. Uh, yeah. I know you have a daughter, mm -hmm. uh, like she gets acne, like heavy, and mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't like it. She's, and she says, mom, can I get on the birth control pill? What would your advice be? Well, it would depend. It would depend on how old she was, in yeah. part, because um, the research seems to indicate that adolescent women are particularly vulnerable to some of the especially mood-related side effects yeah, yeah, um, of the birth control pill. So right, and, yeah. um, and so I, and the brain is still developing. I mean, even without any research, you know, mm -hmm. like even if there was zero research on, on adolescent girls being particularly vulnerable to any types of psychological effects, um, the brain isn't done developing until you're in your like mid to late 20s, um, but it's really under heavy developmental construction, 19 and younger. Um, and during this time, during this post-pubertal brain development mm -hmm. surge, the, the sort of head contractor in that remodeling project that we go in from childhood into adulthood is your sex hormones. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's puberty. And so that's laying down, you know, that's like actually laying down structural framework in your brain. And so I'm just really cautious with it. So yeah. if she was, you know, 19 and younger, um, I would say if it was for something like regulating her skin, I would say let's try other things first. Mm -hmm. If it was for something like preventing pregnancy and I didn't feel like she was responsible enough to, to do something else, um, I still might say, like, let's go ahead. Uh, you know, we were, we're, we're sort of weighing what the risks and the benefits are. Yeah. And in some cases, I think that the risks and the benefits are going to land on the side of the birth control pill. And on other side, in other cases, I think that it won't, And which is why I think it's so information for women to have this information mm -hmm. and mothers to have this information. Mm -hmm. And so that way we can make those decisions for ourselves. Because for each one of us, yeah. where, where it lands is going to be different. Yeah, clear. So um, I have room for like uh, one or two questions from the audience and it should really about this top, you know, because we're going to talk about politics and general practitioners and men. So yeah, there's one question over there and over there. Yeah. Um, hi, I wanted to ask you uh, if in the research that you presented, um, if, if the research was specifically on uh, one um, type of pill or if it was like a mixed research on, you know, the different types of pill. Uh, and then if I can squeeze in another one is if there, if there are permanent side effects. So if you stop taking the pill, you know, if it will. Right. I mean, I, I'll say um, what, what I know about this first, and that is that the majority of the research that's out there is, is, has a whole variety of different types of pills. They, they crudely link, like sort of lump women into, you know, on hormonal contraceptives or not. Every once in a while, it'll get a little bit more specific, like on second generation, per, like uh, birth control pills, which use a second generation progestin. But that's, that's much rarer in, um, in the literature. It tends to be these really sort of um, heterogeneous groups of women. And um, the unfortunate thing about this is that this is playing a role in some of these things where some women have the effect and some women don't. And these inconsistencies that we see in the literature, because sometimes researchers will find this pattern, other times researchers oops, won't find that pattern. And in part, that has to do surely with the types of progestins that they're on. Um, and so the, the research, you know, sort of moving forward is very hard because given that there's almost 100 formulations out there when you do a study and recruit women, I mean, it, it becomes a mess. And so, um, but w we need to move that way with the research. 
Um, and then the second question was um, long time effect. Oh, the long term effect. You know, and and um, and and I'll be curious to see what what you know about this. But I've found that there's very very little research in terms of the long term effects of birth control pill use on on outcomes. Like there is some research. I, I read something recently. Um, that showed, you know, and again, this is associational research, so we just have to like take everything with a grain of salt and not think causally, but um, that the levels of sex hormone binding globulin that are responsible for keeping testosterone levels suppressed remain elevated after discontinuing the birth control pill. Um, I've also seen that uh, some research indicating that um, if you take birth control pills during adolescence, um, that it is associated with an increased risk for depression across your lifetime, even after you go off of the birth control pill. And so um, that suggests that there may be some sort of long-term effect, but the research on this is almost zero. Um, in, in, yeah. Yeah. So research is lacking about how permanent these effects are, definitely, so we cannot say much about it. There's also some research showing that some effects might be reversible, meaning that they would stop when you quit with the pill. Um, so right now we need to do more longitudinal research to follow women yeah, while yeah. they're on the pill. Thanks for your questions. There was one question here from the guy, the blue shirt. <laughs> Okay, now um, I heard there's a lot of uh, research done, but a lot of research missing. What kind of um, research are you looking forward to that's going to give more clarity? Is there something going on that, we, that you're looking at that can be yeah, helping to get more information that we need in the, on the topic? I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. We need more research, and I think we need uh, to know who is most vulnerable, so who is most sensitive for side effects. Um, you so, mean already in the age group? Because yes. I think we have determined the age group, yeah. right? But then, so, yeah. yeah, so whether it uh, is, is true that um, uh, teenage girls are more sensitive mm -hmm. to developing. Um, I also think that research should show um, causal effects instead of correlational effects. Mm -hmm. So I think these two things are the most important. Mm -hmm. Like who responds well and who doesn't respond well? That is one of the, the main questions. And how p permanent are these effects? Yeah. Like you asked, like, yeah. We have a short reaction here. Just a no, but is it, is those, that kind of research uh, ongoing at the moment or is somebody doing those? Uh... So, <laughs> so uh, currently we are planning research at uh, um, Utrecht University to study whether uh, um, adolescent girls, so girls from 14 to uh, 19 years, are um, um, yeah, sensitive to the effects of the pill by following them, yeah. Okay, then we now go to men. Uh, you can stay and uh, <laughs> we're gonna talk about the role and responsibility of men and of course to talk about whether there, when there will be a, a man pill or a meal pill or whatever. Um, and I'm gonna discuss this also with uh, Indike van der Vlucht from Rutgers. But she first, before she's gonna give her talk, she wants to show us a short clip. It is in Dutch. Is there someone in the audience who isn't Dutch? Oh yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> so after the clip, uh, we will tell you what you've just been seeing. It's, I, I think you will understand, but uh, yeah, just uh, please show the clip. Uh, ik wil graag naar een recept voor de pil bestellen. Mm -hmm. Ja, vanaf hier bij de apotheek. Dank u wel. Eigenlijk er nog een tijd om bij de apotheek. Ik wil ook voor je langs gaan hoor, ik zit er praktisch om de hoek. Nou, ja, als je dat zou willen, graag. Tuurlijk. Kan je die niet meteen voor een heel jaar bestellen of zo? Uh, betaal jij het? Wordt het niet vergoed dan? Nee. Bevalt het je wel? Met de pil? Mm -hmm. Jawel. Ik moet alleen wel om denken om mijn dag te slikken. Nou, ik zal je ook wel helpen heden, oké? Okay? Splitten we samen de kosten. Would you like to tell them what we've just been seeing, or should I shall it, tell it yeah, very quickly? Yeah, I can tell yeah? Uh, the audience what you have Please seen. Please uh, talk in the, in the mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's just a very uh, short film. Yeah. 
to uh, show um, what are the burden of uh, women when they uh, use uh, contraception. And we switch the role between the men and uh, the women. So we, uh, you can see, uh, yeah, you can imagine what it uh, meant for, uh, for a girl when she uh, used contraception. So we make it a little bit confusing and uh, also with uh, some humor. And uh, well, uh, I think 170,000 young people uh, viewed uh, or ha have uh, seen, have watched the film. And uh, they were really, uh, yeah, enthusiastic, positive about it. And this was only one of the films we used to uh, address the topic of responsibility on contraception. Uh, I don't know if you understand the, the film quite well. What is your reaction on it mm -hmm. when you looked at it? Maybe it's a little bit confusing, but afterwards you could see, well, okay, oh, that's what, uh, what they mean with it. Well, two years ago, as Rutgers, we started uh, with a small campaign to raise the awareness and the role of men when it comes to contraception. We interviewed young men and asked them who is responsible for contraception. Some of the boys said men are as responsible as a woman and some boys didn't feel responsible at all. Or they said, well, if the sex was occasional, meaning not in a romantic relationship, and the ma majority said they didn't feel uh, responsible uh, at all. It was the first time that we discussed this topic with uh, young uh, men. And, uh, well, I think it's a very important uh, topic to uh, put also uh, boys on board. And we focused only on the young men, the young adults, uh, because I think we can win something over there. And the conventional wisdom holds women primarily responsible for contraception and the prevention of pregnancy, we think. In the sexual arena, boys and girls, young adults, are still dealing with conflicting and confusing gender norms, also about contraception, sexuality, and the expectations they have in relationships. Just two examples. Uh, a girl uh, met a boy and they have a uh, one-night stand. In the heat of the moment, the girl refused to have sex without a condom. The boy didn't carry a condom with him and he got angry. And he thought, well, the girl, uh, you were using, or, or they thought or assumed, the girl was using the pill, but he didn't check it before. So it's about expectations also. Or the girl told her friend, her boyfriend, that she didn't have her period last month. She could be pregnant because she had forgotten to take the pill. He trusted her and now she was, he was blaming her that she forgot the pill. So who is responsible? And that's really confusing in sexual relationships. Young men often expect young girls take their responsibility by using the pill or an IUD. And in general, most of the girls do. And young girls complain, and also um, uh, female adults complain, that boys or young men are too selfish, that they are too easygoing and not interested in contraception at all. And girls are often confronted with boys who don't want to use a condom. So what to do? And research showed last year that 40% uh, of the young men didn't use a condom at all during a one-night stand. So it's really high. <laughs> uh, and of course, boys can be confronted with unwanted pregnancy because she forgot to take the pill or she forgot to organize contraception. In practice, young men and young women face very different biological, social, and medical realities. 
regarding pregnancy, sexuality, and birth control. And with often uh, results, which often result in unequal opportunities, expectations, and responsibilities. For we know only women can get pregnant. And so they will thus experience greater negative consequences from an unwanted pregnancy. This is why men, young men, expect that women will take their responsibility. It governs also the negotiation of contraceptive use in sexual relationships. And the availability, as we all know, for men, for, of contraceptives for men, is still very, very limited. We only have a condom or the male sterilization. Women take, in general, control over their body by using contraceptives. And of course, this, this is, uh, uh, yeah, it brings us uh, where we are now. So as we, when we look at the Netherlands, um, we have a very low rate of unwanted pregnancies. And also abortion, um, when we look at uh, the rate here, it's so round about 30,000. And we can be proud of it. When we look at uh, the contraceptive use uh, of young people up to 18 to 24 years old, year olds, then we could see that, uh, that uh, 50 percent uh, of them used the contraceptive pill, over 50 percent, and only 8 percent used a condom, and 12 percent uh, used uh, the condom and the pill together. The Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch way we said. <laughs> In education and online media, the focus is mainly on women when it comes to prevention of pregnancies and uh, contraception. And it is time to get men on board. In our opinion, the distribution of burden and the benefits regarding birth control is really unequal. And we all know the burden of contraception on women. They have to be uh, yeah, they, ha they have to anticipate, they have to be prepared in time, they have to visit a doctor, uh, they have to go to the pharmacy, uh, they have to pay for contraceptives, uh, they have to decide what kind of contraception will suit the best for me. So this is, uh, this is a, a big task for women. We don't realize what it, uh, what it means to uh, use contraceptive. So what could be the role for men? How can we find a solution for the conflicting norms and messages on responsibility and contraception? Because on the one hand, we emphasize the right of the women's bodily autonomy. Uh, and on the other hand, we ask for more shared uh, responsibility. How do, we deal with, how do we deal with it? This is also confusing for men. And it is a misunderstanding that uh, men don't want to be involved. Um, for sure, also men don't want to be confronted with unwanted pregnancies. And of course, they want a voice in the decision making when it comes to having a child or not. So what can men do? Uh, do they, can they have a role or not? Well. We think uh, men can start the discussion with other young men to make them more aware of the dominant pressure on contraception and the burden women are faced with. Men can start the conversation with a partner and not waiting till she will uh, start with a uh, 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 with the introduction of the uh, topic, not only on how to, prote to be protected, but also how to have sex in a pleasurable, uh, pleasurable way. Men can participate in a decision-making process. They can be more interested in what kind of contraceptions do we have. And they can be more informed about how it works. 
what does it mean for men and uh, or, or what does it mean for a woman to use contraception uh, during five uh, years or uh, longer and how to make choices they can be more supportive after the decision making to be more involved to be uh, so they can ask are you satisfied with your uh, chosen contraception etc and of course they can share the costs Men can use more often a condom without protest, and they can carry the burden of maybe less pleasure. Well, Rutgers will put on more efforts to engage men on this topic and to reframe the contraceptive responsibility as shared across gender lines. And it takes two to become pregnant, and it should take two to prevent one. So I would show two short films to show uh, what uh, men think about uh, the pill for men and what they think of sharing the costs of contraception. Oh, yeah, we can show the film. <laughs> Je bent toch zelf verantwoordelijk voor je eigen, je eigen toekomst. Dus als dat voor mij betekent dat ik daar meer geld aan uitgeef, ja, dan vind ik dat eigenlijk wel prima. Ik vind eigenlijk gewoon dat het gratis moet zijn. Op het moment ik zelf uh, voor mijn pil dan. Uh, maar uiteindelijk zei ik tegen mijn vriend van ja, ik wil dus aan de spiraal. En toen zei hij wel van dan wil ik wel een deel betalen. Dus ja. allebei. Het moet niet zo zijn dat alleen omdat je iets niet kunt betalen, dat je daardoor bijvoorbeeld zwanger raakt. Je kan moeilijk zeggen tegen je vriend van ja, ik wil dat jij het niet gaat betalen. Ik heb, ja, ik heb er geen enkel probleem mee om de helft van me mee te betalen. Ik verplicht de vrouw niet om aan de pil te gaan. Ik, ik ga niet over haar keuzes. Uh, als jij het nodig hebt, dan zou dat nou, in elk geval voor een groot deel gesponsord moeten worden. Het is beter dat je er zelf iets voor betaalt dan dat je het niet doet en je bent achteraf, uh, heb je ineens iets verkeerd. Dus ik vind het ook niet erg om ervoor te betalen. So there are very, very different ideas about sharing costs uh, on contraception uh, between men and uh, women. And the other uh, video, there was another one or there isn't? Oh, okay. Yeah. Het ligt aan de bijwerkingen. Would you maar geen bijwerkingen. De vrouwen hebben het altijd al geslikt. En ik denk dat de switch naar man heel moeilijk is. Een relatie zijn, zij heeft nou heel veel last van de, van de pil en het werkt niet met de spiraal. Zo, dan zou ik het zeker wel bewegen. Als je met een pil ja, altijd een beetje naar de bijwerkingen kijken natuurlijk. Nu zie je ook wel vaak dat een vrouw het makkelijk vergeet. Ik ben zelf soms best wel aan het warrel. Ik zou hem ook kunnen vergeten. Ik zou er geen enkel probleem mee hebben als het niet echt maar bijwerking heeft. Ik zou willen weten wat voor hormonen ik in mijn lichaam stop natuurlijk. that men are so conscious about, you know, hormones in the body, you know, it's, I mean, wow. Um, yeah, with, because with regard to, you know, the, the first campaign video that we saw was really about, you know, sharing the emotional burden, sharing the practical burden, sharing the financial burden, right? Yeah. But it doesn't say anything about the fact, you know, that you're not sharing the hormonal burden, yeah, you know, right? Of course, that's not possible. No. <laughs> um, but is Rutgers also actively, I don't know, supporting research that is searching for, you know, a hormonal solution to bring the, you know? Well, we advocate for it, yeah. but we can't finance research. We don't have the money for no, okay, this. Okay, that's not what you do, but no. you advocate for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Estrella and Sarah, I, I know it's not your field of research, but maybe you've looked into it a little bit. I it and I found that over decades there's already been research in hormonal contraceptives for men um, but why isn't it here yet <laughs> <laughs> well you know they had they had the ones in um, clinical trials this was I, I don't know it was probably it was a probably a decade ago now yeah. and then they discontinued it because the men were complaining about the side effects and um, and they were and they were complaining about the side effects to such a degree that um, that they actually had to stop it because it was considered unethical. Do you know what, what the side effects were? And it was the same things that women have been dealing with for decades. <laughs> mood swings. Okay. Mood swings. Mood yeah, swings, mood swings. Example. 
skin mood swings, problems. mood swings, skin problems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there have Depression. been, but there also have been more trials. Yeah. And I think right now there are uh, busy developing and testing. Um, uh, a male hormonal contraceptive that yeah. is a gel. Yeah, I, yeah. So first trials were with injections, which yeah. I mean, yeah. I can imagine that that is painful and that that might be yeah. a bit like uh, monthly different. injections, weekly, or? weekly well, we, injections. Okay, yeah. And um, so now the the research is more focusing on gels, which are of course, uh, I think many um, men would also say that they they would like to use it when it would be on the market. Yeah. Well, well, so I don't know if this is the same gel that I've heard about, but the one I heard about I think was crazy because, um, and you can tell me if this is if this is the same thing or not. But I've, I've so I also read about um, uh, it's, it's on trial in the in the U.S. right now. It's under trials, and um, and it's a gel. And maybe the guys in the audience can tell me how many of them would like to use this gel. Um, it decreases your testosterone to such a degree that you stop producing sperm. Who's signing up? <laughs> like most men, um, most men have, like don't like the idea of their testosterone being suppressed. And in fact, at the U.S., right, like across the street from every Starbucks, which we have on every corner, there's now a testosterone clinic, right, for men who are suffering from low T. Um, so most men, men tend to be kind of protective of their testosterone. And I'm not saying that this is a good thing, right? I'm not saying like let's save the testosterone. But um, just rather, if you know anything about human nature, um, this might not be the best avenue to be going down to pursue male birth control, because I don't know very many men who are, are like be super excited about this possibility um, as their mode of, um, as their mode of uh, birth control. I'm hoping that um, we get more research, both for men and for women. I mean, if you look at what drug companies are investing in, the research and development in women's, like, in, in hormonal, contra or any sort of, like, contraception is almost nothing. It's, like, less than 1% of their budget is going for research and development. And so we need to push for more options out there because there's no reason that we can't come up with something better. But, like, if there would be this wonder pill, you know, with side effects that even a man, you know, can live with, um, <laughs> <laughs> would you... I was thinking, like... Would I trust a man with the pill? Because, you know, if he forgets the pill, it, there's no consequence for him, you know? So it's so... I mean, there are pills that I never forget, and there are pills that I often forget, and it has all to do with consequences. So if there would be this pill, and all this research to this pill, would it make any sense, you know? Because who's going to trust? Uh, well, I think in... Well, I think in intimate relationships, yeah. And after a period of uh, using uh, the contraceptive pill yeah. or in other methods, it uh, would make sense yeah. uh, if uh, men uh, could uh, take over the role of the women yeah. by using uh, a, a man pill or an injectable. It doesn't matter. But it's, of course, about trust yeah. also. Yeah. Can you trust your partner? Yeah. And uh, so you have to do it together. Yeah. But I think there will be a market for it. And I think it's growing. Mm. And also because of the side effects of uh, uh, hormonal uh, contraception. Mm. And it's only uh, yeah, infecting now the women. And yeah. it's very unequal. Let's so do something. I, may, I made this up spontaneously. So if you're a man in the audience, and there would be this pill with no you know, big uh, con uh, side effects, and you are in a stable relationship, would you consider using it? Please raise your hand. Ah, oh, yeah. Some well, look them. at that. Well. The men. Which I know this was, I mean, the men. who didn't <laughs> raise his hand? The men raised the hand. Yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah. I mean, of course, this is no evidence. There's a lot of problem with this evidence, but I think it's a yeah. good sign that uh, um, uh, there is a willingness, as you say. Yeah, yeah there is so. a willingness. Yeah. Yeah, but I think yeah. the pharmacy don't want to invest in this research. Okay. Because they think, well, men don't want to. Yeah. But I wonder. So we are very dependent on the, the financial uh, situation of the pharmacies if yeah. they want to invest in it. And they invest only in uh, yeah, the, 
yeah, new forms of uh, contraception, but it's not very revolutionary. A last question, because you say so we also have to change kind of the mindset, you know, of men um, by bringing men together. But I thought if the Bali would say like, oh, we're organizing an evening for men to talk about contraceptive, I think it would be a very different turnout. <laughs> like, you know, I think yeah. there would be because yeah. it's not what they're. You need, I, what do you need? Do you need like role models, you know, like influencers? Yeah. Like, yeah. how do you think about, <laughs> no, because... Uh, yeah, we need them, yeah. we need them. Because uh, when we, when I look back two years ago, when yeah. we started with a small campaigns, with yeah. films, yeah. it was a huge topic yeah. during uh, World Contraception Day. Mm -hmm. It was about the film, uh, what do you think of contraception? And it makes men more aware about yeah. the position of women on this topic. Yeah. And uh, so also journalists were <laughs> more aware about uh, yeah. the position of, we of uh, women. Yeah. And they talked about it. So it was the first time that a lot of men talked with each other about this topic. And when we asked, do you talk about this topic? Yeah, we talk about sex, but not about contraception. Because it's, it's more uh, the responsibility of women. Are you also pushing it, oh, hello, yeah. Are you also pushing it to be more like also already part of the sex education like at high schools? Yeah. You know, that yeah, boys yeah, yeah, become yeah, aware yeah, of yeah, yeah. Yeah. We are very busy with okay. it to put it more also in the educational programs. Yeah. Uh, also uh, situations as, uh, well, if you were Jack and uh, your girlfriend uh, get pregnant, what are you going to do? Yeah. How will your friends uh, rea react or uh, your uh, mother, etc., etc. Yeah. So yeah. we put also the position of uh, uh, the male partner more uh, into the education yeah. programs. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this, Tinka, Inika, sorry. Thank you, Estrella, for all your uh, very interesting uh, contributions. And a uh, big round of applause. I will go to my last discussion <laughs> table. Um, yes, please have a seat. Uh, I would like to invite Liliane Plume. Liliane Plume is a politician and member of the House of Representatives, and she has been an advocate for the reproductive rights and contraception. And she started the campaign She Decides, an initiative of about 50 countries, organizations, and foundations to finance global family planning initiatives. In the response to a decision of President Trump, Trump. Yeah. to take away the financing. I mean, this is the political yeah. edge yes, to she, it. Yes. yes. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may have heard of him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then last, uh, Peter Funk. <laughs> he has been a general practitioner for, I can think, say, several decades. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's very that's interesting right. because you can Fresh give us a historical school. overlook in, you know, oh, how, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you have a practice in the center of Amsterdam and you are, all, are also a student. You work at the Student Medical Center. Yes. So, so you, you see very, mm -hmm. a lot of young women, you know, who, who deal with this issue. Um, and my first question is to you, like the last question on the issue of men, because I was wondering in your practice, did ever a guy came to your office and said, doctor, is there something like a male contraceptive I can use or take? There are women who are asking that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, not so many, because we know that, there is, that it, it isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. So no that is not a, that's not an issue in our practice. Has ever come a couple to you to um, express, you know, their concerns about contraceptives for the woman? Like, you know, that, that she was there with her partner and he was also expressing his concerns? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. yeah th th that comes. But mostly women comes alone. Yeah, yeah women come alone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Liliane, my first question mm -hmm. to you, and then we go really into the, your general practice. Um, so you're not only a politician, you're also an outspoken feminist. And um, you have always fought for reproductive rights mm -hmm. and contraception. And yeah, how are you looking about, you know, discussing contraception? Do you find it also a difficult discussion because it involves such an important uh, tool for women to enable their independence? Well, I mean, I was very... Um, um, 
encouraged and uh, by what you were saying um, that we also have to give the power of information in the hands of women. So my perspective is that uh, as a woman, I have to be able to decide about my body. I have to decide for myself if I want to have sex with whom, uh, if I want to have babies, when, and, and, uh, and so um, the having access to information is part of that, uh, whatever you want to call it, empowerment. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's really important to be able to talk about and to open up the discussion on what is the impact of, in this case, contraceptives on how I feel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, I've, when I started using the pill, ages, decades ago, I have to say, <laughs> decades. Um, I mean, we also talked about, you know, uh, don't you get fat about yeah. it, which is... Yeah, we haven't uh, discussed that one. No, yeah. I mean, it's also something about, you know, how bad, why is it a big thing if you get, you know, if you add more kilos, but that was not the debate at that time. Um, and um, so, um, what does it mean? Do I have mood swings? I mean, it has been part of a discussion of using contraceptives, I think, for a much longer time. But there have been no data or no broader discussions. And interestingly, love, I mean, I've been on the pill, I think, maybe 25 years or so. And I had a wonderful general practitioner. I mean, she was great. Uh, but we never had a conversation on do you experience any side effects? So there is not in in the relationship between doctor and patient. Yeah. There's never, I mean, not to my knowledge, there's not like a fixed time where you sit down and say, okay, you're using this now three years. How do you feel? Well, uh, so you provide me the excellent uh, bridge yeah. that I mm. because mm. yeah. Mm. Peter, I don't know. But if maybe you, he does it. But yeah, yeah, I don't know mm. if there is something like you know the general GP. Mm. I mean, it's going to be your personal experience. But you know, so as a general pr practitioner, practitioner, uh, how much are you involved in this decision-making process when a woman decides, you know, she wants to go on the pill? Yeah. yeah. Now, um, what shall I say? First, it is <laughs> important that women are in, in, uh, have has, uh, enough information. Uh, do you provide that's the them, starting. Do you provide them with this information? And we do that. We, in our practice, we made even a website. It's mm -hmm. in Dutch. Keuzehulpanticonceptie.nl mm -hmm. Everyone in the whole world who can read Dutch <laughs> can look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In English also, but it's a bit different. <laughs> uh, which gives all kinds of information about birth control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can be helpful to figure out what is the best thing for me or for her. Um, is it also already including the effects on, you know, uh, on the brain, the psychological effects, or is it more about the physical effects? There are, uh, uh, is information about the kinds of contraceptive and also the side effects. And, and also psychological side effects. And also, the, yeah, every doctor knows that there are psychological side effects of the is that, is that true? Like, did yes. what you heard to should to tonight mm. in the speech, was it all common knowledge to you? Uh, it should be. It is, in, <laughs> it is also in the, we call it bijsluiter. We can read mm. it, everyone can read it by itself. And mm. it is known, old, always known that, uh, say, depression is one of the side effects of birth control. It's not si said that it should be, it no. is a possibility. Yeah. And that brings me also to a, a point over here that every woman is different. Mm. You cannot say, yeah. you cannot say every woman is the same. Okay. We see women who are using birth control and do not have any complaints mm -hmm. from it. Yeah. And it is rare, but it it comes through that some some women do have problems. And do then it's a, you're you right. Mean, yeah. Then mm. the doctor and the patient, mm. but the patient first, I think. Mm should know that it could be a result of the birth control. We have had a woman, we were not coming to our practice, but mm -hmm. we were going to a psychologist mm -hmm. for a depression, a severe yeah. depression. He had an intrauterine device with hormones. Yeah. And after three, four, no, three years, that, and just, it never, uh, nothing worked. Mm -hmm. uh, Antidepressive medication didn't work, therapy didn't work. 
then at least someone said, ah, oh, perhaps it's the ID, and they removed it, and it was all over. Mm. But it's not yes. common. That's not it's, common. It's rare. Do you find uh, women very interested in the effects of the pill? Like when they come to you, do they show a lot of interest? Mm. Therefore, it is important that you have information, and most women are getting the information from their mother and from mm. girlfriends and social media. And this information is not, not that no, well. No, because you said we have our website, but are mm -hmm. women like, oh yeah, a website, yeah. Or, you know, do you think they go home and really thoroughly go through your website? What is your yeah, that's experience? That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most women are, who are coming for contraception, yeah. we, have, we have two, the beginning of two choices, yeah. with hormones or without hormones. Mm -hmm. Most women say we like to be sure, mm -hmm and then give me something what's in the lowest dose of hormones. Mm. That's the question. That's all, yeah. And there are no questions, yeah, and getting uh, uh, your mm. weight, that's a problem. Mm. Uh, but there are no questions about depression or sadness of that kind of things. Yeah. And you have to also to consider that when women are not using birth control, no hormones, they have their periods, mm. And I don't know if there are some women who are, have a period and have also mood swings and depressions mm. before and after. So that's also a thing. And even when you have that in a very intense way, birth control with hormones can help. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, when we're talking about side effects from birth control when women are starting, mm -hmm. then it could be a positive effect that yeah. it um, equalize the mood a little mm. bit, and mood swings are less. And so this has what pros I've and heard, contrast. What I've heard a lot is so yeah, uh, my uh, GP got me on an anti or sorry, a contraception, yeah. but then we never discussed it mm. anymore. You mm. know, it was just a fact. Shouldn't it be a responsibility not only of the client but also from the doctor to like yearly or once mm. in two years have a talk about how is this working for you? You know, etc. Yeah. We have the birth control pill now uh, 60, year, yeah, 60 years already in the Netherlands. Um, in the beginning, uh, we asked women to come every half year. Really? To, to in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> every half year uh, to do a gynecological uh, examination and uh, body weight and blood pressure. And during those decades, the concentrates of the hormones in the pill were lower, mm -hmm. so there were lighter pills. And the side effects are that low mm -hmm. that when we have to ask every woman to come, mm -hmm. you have to ask 900 women to come and for the benefit of hundreds of them. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a point. And therefore, uh, in the 80s, 80, in the 80s and the 90s, we stopped with birth control uh, in the general mm. practice, and it's true, it gives a uh, responsibility to the woman and the doctor, and the doctor should say, I give you a birth control tablet, mm -hmm. try that, mm -hmm. and when you are satisfied, then you can get it. It's also to know that, perhaps you don't know, um, you have to know, you have, when you start with birth control tablets, mm -hmm. you, you have to, uh, to get one times a prescription, mm -hmm. one time, yeah. and after that you can go to the but pharmacy. You never have to go to the doctor again. No. Never see the doctor no. again. Yeah. Um, yeah, Should we change pitfall. that? Like, yeah, that mm. after a year, you know, the pharmacist cannot give, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. Dutch policy. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Would that yeah, be a good that idea? Let's go to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go to the politician. No, I think the fifth day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yes. yeah, not me, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Liliana, so mm -hmm. you've been, you know, actively promoting that everyone has access to all kinds of birth control, yeah. but we've just heard that every type of birth control mm -hmm. that consists of hormones has the effect on your brain, you know, so uh, do you ever feel uneasy to promote something that has these effects on women's brain? On well, no, actually, <laughs> um, because I think everyone should be able to access contraception. I also advocate uh, it to be part of uh, the basic insurance package, yeah. so it should be free for everyone. And I think all methods of contraception should be free to everyone so that you can make an informed choice mm -hmm. together with your doctor 
what suits you the best in uh, in a specific period in your life. Mm -hmm. And so um, I I do feel that, um, and and this is the power of information. I do feel that it is necessary that in general there's much more. Um, uh, much more investment in in, um, uh, in in the impact of pharmaceuticals broadly and healthcare in general uh, on on women's bodies, and so I would be happy to see more research. But for me, it's no reason to say you know. I do think that women should and are able to make decisions for themselves, and um, many of us use contraception, um, and many of us. And all of us should know that if you are feel, if you're feeling uneasy in one way or another, mm -hmm. that you should go to the doctor and not hesitate because it's not something that you make up or which is not relevant. It can be relevant. I mean, we don't know, but it can be relevant. And I think, to me, that would be the message uh, of this evening that um, it, what you feel is always relevant. And so go to your doctor and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. You were... Uh, talking about you know research in uh, medicine for women yeah. and re research in, in women's health. If we make the discussion a little bit broader, a mm -hmm. little bit broader, because it has been lacking enormously, right? Right. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you have any facts or figures, but I mean, so many medicines haven't been checked on women right. at yeah. all. Yeah. So, mm. is it on your political agenda to? Well, yeah, it? definitely it is. So, I mean, a, a woman's body is different from a man's body, and many uh, medicines are tested uh, only on men. Mm. Uh, and what you see sometimes is that women benefit from a higher dose, a lower dose, a different dose. Um, so that's one issue that is relevant. The other is that. A woman's heart is different from a woman's, from a man's heart, and so the way that you experience health issues can be very different. Uh, and so um, uh, we've seen a lot of talking about this, but not too much changes in policies. Okay. And so I plan to present. Uh, it's a lot of work, so <laughs> bear with me. But I, we, I plan to present, like in March, April. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, a series of policy proposals uh, to the current government to invest more in uh, knowledge about women's bodies yeah. uh, in, in relation to health, but also, to give an example, to not finance any uh, medical research anymore if it's not also focused on gender differences on a specific topic. And so there will be a series of proposals. And I think it's really important that in all of, in the way that healthcare is organized, that there's research in healthcare, that we do research on women's bodies as well as on men's bodies. Because if that had been the case, many of the questions that you and Estella have been raising and, and many of the questions I think that all of us have, would have been researched long ago. Yeah. Uh, and I do think there's a role for politics here because uh, the pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, they're, they're doing great work, but they're also generating the most profit of any industry in the world. And so they are setting their own agendas while it should be us uh, that should also has, uh, yeah, have, clearly. I mean, all of us also ha should have an influence on that agenda. So no, that's think, what we're yeah. trying to well, I think we're gonna present follow. in yeah. March and April, yeah. and I hope to yeah. be able to see all of you at that presentation. <laughs> yeah. We will. Let's go back to the pill a little bit, because um, as in the US, but also in the Netherlands, there has been a decrease in pill use, and it's mm. kind of significant. It's like 10%. So my first question was, do you experience this already in your practice? Like. Yeah, we, we do. There are lots of women who are asking for the intrauterine device, and also they, they, they seek a, um, an alternative for the the normal pill. Yeah. Um, and the normal pill has also it has benefits, but also yeah, you have to take it every day. You you should not forget it. Um, so many women have heard about intrauterine devices, and um, we're providing them very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very helpful, although they have also side effects, which... Um, yeah, we've heard. On a hormonal level, it doesn't really change anything. Well, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> it, it can be. Uh, sorry, uh, we have 
intrauterine device with hormones, only one hormone, progesterone hormone, mm. which means that you cannot regulate your period, and mm. that's uh, uh, for mm. some people good, for some people not. But we also provide, of course, um, uh, copper IODs, which uh, now mm. have and hormones. Are they popular? And that is, no, they're not that popular, but they should be more popular because okay. they're very, because, because they're very cheap and they can mm. be in the uterus for 10 years. So it is also for a long, long period. So that does help, that does help people with, say, uh, contraceptives are expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I would say copper IUD, 50 euro, 10 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe I've completely yeah. missed something, but with the copper IUD, there's no hormones? Yes, the copper IUD does not have any hormones. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's the copper that... Yeah. 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 Oh, but, oh but, I had no idea. Oh, okay, so I heard at something our website. new. Oh, sorry, <laughs> go to the website and hopefully you're not... Um, but it has side effects also. What are the mm. side effects? Because why isn't any, mm. everyone on this? Because uh, you have to go to the doctor to bring it in. That's also with the uh, other yeah. interview yeah. device. It's not every, easy for every woman to do so. Yeah. And um, you, have, you, 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 you will keep your own cycle, your mm -hmm. own menstruation cycle. And sometimes, not every time, but sometimes it can be a little bit more or a, little, a day longer. So that's the side effect of copper ID. Mm -hmm. But okay. it is as safe as the pill. So it mm -hmm. should be known that there yeah. is mm -hmm. an alternative. So do you also promote it a little bit? Like if women are in doubt, you're like... Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, no. Yeah. It's good. It's good to know. Or is it also in the U.S. a, a common th like a common thing or not it's, at all? It's far. Um, it's far more common in the mm -hmm. U.S. for people to be on the hormone, the hormonal IUD. Mm -hmm. But the copper IUD is gaining mm -hmm. in popularity as um, we see, especially with the younger um, generations of women. They mm -hmm. tend to be sort of steering away from mm -hmm. um, the hormonal uh, contraceptives and mm -hmm. trying to find something that doesn't influence what their hormones are doing. Yeah. Just that, so that that worry is out of the way, there isn't a decrease, or is the, is the decrease in using the pill, is it also a financial reason? Do people stop it because it isn't anymore in the... Uh, in the well, there's uh, that also, um, um, uh, that question mm. has not been fully <laughs> answered. I mean, there's okay. a, a lack of data. I posed many, many quest questions to the Minister of Healthcare in the Netherlands, you know, finding out about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for how many women or men is the cost an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's not a lot of answers to that. But we do see that uh, for some women, uh, it is expensive. And mm -hmm. I, I would just say, if you're uh, a single mom mm -hmm. and uh, you have two daughters mm -hmm. uh, and they're like 17 and up, that means that you have to provide for uh, contraceptives for three women in your household. And it can be expensive. Yeah. And I, I but mean... It, it's still 18, right? Or not? Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. It's, yeah. So, yeah, they're 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're 19, okay. yeah. yeah. And so, um, so, yes. And what we do hear from women mm. <clears throat> is that they sometimes make a different choice, that they choose the pill because mm. that's the least expensive, mm. uh, while they might prefer an IUD, copper, mm. or hormonal. Yeah. And so, but there's, and that, I mean, there's a bit of a lack of data, which is also really not good, because, because we know everything about everyone in this country. <laughs> we know if you prefer, you know, uh, skimmed milk or fat milk. <laughs> we know all that, but we don't know a lot about this. Um, but I've... So the reason why I... Is this due to political interest or due to public interest? I think both. Okay. Uh, and um, I think um, we have grown used to the fact that uh, our insurance does not pay for it. Mm. Uh, while up to 2011, uh, it was the case. It has mm. been out, in and out, and in and out. Uh, but I do think it's uh, in a civilized society, you pay for contraceptives all together. It's a matter of solidarity. And so that's why I'm advocating for that. Right, clear. Yeah. Yeah. And just to make sure, um, it's not been the case that there has been a decrease in pill use and an increase in abortion. No. No, it's no. stable. No. It's stable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, that's and good. very low. The and very lowest low. rate, uh, one of the lowest yeah, but, rates in the world. But even more than 30,000 women yes. a year. Yes. And it could be a good idea, and it is also a good idea to provide women who are getting an abortion mm. to give 
to give them uh, birth control because yeah. we know that when women from those 30,000, mm -hmm. uh, 30 percent, so that's yeah. 10,000, yeah. did have ha had an abortion yeah. before. Yeah. So okay. that's yeah. a target. Yeah. Other, because yeah, it's birth a, it's control, a of aligned course. discussion, but it's like it's yeah. but it's not it's not it's another topic. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> birth control yeah. is to prevent pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. No, and yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, and that's also involving the subject because yeah. when you're pregnant, when you are pregnant, you feel also different, um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and there are some hormones involved. So that's also Definitely true. true. Um, <laughs> I saw that we only have five minutes, and oh, I still wow. have to do questions from the audience because okay. I hear I think you are mumbling because you want to have a drink, but <laughs> also because you have questions. So let's do three quick questions. Oh God! Uh, <laughs> what? Which one? Well, you've been already uh, yeah. there. The woman with the the the, the block hacker. How you say that? The wood shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Wood chopper. Hi, I'm a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And a so what? a pelvic floor physiotherapist, Beckham Bodum? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah okay. And um, I've worked with a lot of women who develop vestibulodynia because of um, hormonal birth control, which means that the tissues of their vulva become so sore that they can't touch it, they can't have sex, they can't do anything, and it can be very severe and um, hard for their lives. So we've also recommended the copper IUD, but I also want to say that that can also cause other problems mm -hmm. as well with the uterus. The copper ID is quite big, and so that can actually, the main mm -hmm. point of how it works is it causes inflammation mm -hmm. in the area. Mm -hmm. And so if it becomes too inflamed, then the uterus can actually either cause pain, lower back pain, mm -hmm. leg pain. So it's a good, it's another good option, but might not be a complete option, but I wanted to mm -hmm. kind of put that out there. And then if any of you um, or the bio psychologist mm -hmm. had anything to say about vestibulodynia or kind of more less uh, psychological issues but more um, yeah the physical physic another yeah. you're adding yeah. you're yeah. Are adding another layer of complexity yeah yeah, yeah thank you um, okay a woman in the leather shirt and the glasses yeah uh, on the copper IUD you said that a side effect is that you keep your own menstrual cycle. I don't really see how it's a side effect because it, no, no. the copper ID just prevents pregnancy. So I think. Like, why, why do you see keeping your own menstruation cycle as a side effect? No, just, yeah. no of course, it's not a side effect. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. The side effect is that it could be more painful or could stay longer than the normal period. Yeah. That's a side effect. Yeah. But Could we also the months, I'd say. Only a yeah, few months. It depends. Is there also something that women just don't really want to have a full period anymore? Is that yeah. something that's going on? Yeah. So we're yeah. kind yeah. of... Yeah. yeah, for good reasons, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. It, that's certainly an issue. That is an issue, okay. Um, then there yeah. is the for gentleman the with the glasses. Yeah, like he's two stairs up and he already wants to say something on the issue of men, I think. Uh, no, I don't want to say anything about men. Oh. Um, I, I have developed hormonal contraceptives and drugs for 33 years. Uh. So I have some experience. And there a lot of things have been said tonight that are at least debatable. So you, probably you should do it again with somebody with my background knowledge. But I'd like to say one thing, and that is the advantages of, of, of our conceptives. The, the disadvantages have been addressed extensively, and it's true. And, and the topic of tonight is a very important topic because the, the pill has effect on the brain indeed via most likely testosterone, which is not really addressed tonight. But the point I want to make yeah. is the, I have slides, three slides, with 15 advantages of oral contraception if you take it for a longer time. The pill is the most researched drug in the world. It has been tens and tens of years of follow-up. So you can't say here that there is no follow-up if we don't know anything. There's a lot of knowledge. Let me just give you one example. If you Sorry, I'm just gonna, um, your point is clear, but do you have a question as well for the three people sitting here? <laughs> yeah, no. Just one example. If you take for at least five years of the pill, your risk 
to, 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 to get ovarian cancer, which is a very deadly mm -hmm. disease, is decreased by 80%. Mm -hmm. 80% if you take okay. the pill for five to 10 years. And yeah. the other 14 are comparable. <laughs> okay, I think I'm not going to... Yeah. Estrella wants to react. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be short because um, I think we have a part two coming up of this program. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that, yes, the pill is the most researched medicine in the history of, of medicine. So I think, yes, that's true. But most research in terms of its efficacy and its safety, but not in terms of its side effects yeah. and its psychological effects and its effects on the brain. So I think that is quite mm -hmm. missing here. And yeah, that is I mean, extra remarkable because it's such, it's, it's widely used and it's the most used uh, contraceptive um, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, well, yeah, well, I was just going to, I was going to say, I mean, it's um, a lot of the, the, the effects are based on, it's like, like for, almost like from the neck down, it's, it's like heart and, and veins and, and all of these like, but there hasn't been a lot about the experiential effects of the birth control pill. But you're right, I mean, there's absolutely like so much great research in terms of health benefits. I just read a paper showing that it decreases your risk of colon cancer and they don't even know what the mechanism is. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I mean, so it does do a lot of really amazing things. And these are the conversations that most women's doctors are having with them um, is, from the, is from this other research. But there's this other research um, in the fields of neuroscience and psychology that live over here and medical research lives over here and, and oftentimes people aren't crossing the street mm -hmm. and so this is really about like let, let's cross the street like let's let's see what the psychologists and the neuroscience scientists mm -hmm. have been saying so that way women can just understand their experiences mm -hmm. clear yeah. okay so who wants the responsibility for the last questions that should be very <laughs> interesting and insightful um, oh a lot of people <laughs> Oh, God, I still have to decide. I'll get you. So we've seen that in almost every other area in our lives, there have been great technological advancement, advancements. How and in what way could we see technological advancements in the field of birth control? And I don't mean tracker, mobile applications, but I mean actual physical devices, hardware devices, maybe. Nice. A futurist. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give my thoughts and then you all, I'm sure, have your same thing. But we need investment in research and development. We need, invest. I mean, there hasn't been a new birth control method out there, really. I mean, there's, there's, they're testing this stuff in men. But the stuff that they're testing in men right now is the same stuff that they've been testing for a very long time. It's not new. This is like a new formulation of something that they created a long time ago. And it's not being invested in. And the reason it's not being invested in is because there isn't money to be made. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just not going to be a lucrative and it's not sexy. And, um, and so we need more research. Mm -hmm. Into new, into new technology. We need R&D from the drug companies mm. to be invested in women's health um, and in, in reproductive health. And this goes for both men and women looking for um, ways that we can protect ourselves from pregnancy. There's very little investment in reproductive health. And so we need to like, talk to like, great people like this, <laughs> right, who are actually putting it, like, advocates for um, reproductive health because there isn't a whole lot of investment made in it. So. Thank you. If I'm going to sum up this whole evening, I mm. thought, okay, there are three words <laughs> that come to mind to me, and that is um, information, okay? Mm. So yeah, information is important, but there is also this responsibility to really inform yourself yeah. well. But then there's this word complexity, because either when you inform yourself really well, maybe it can, becomes even more complex, because really what you and also Estrella showed, like it is not a clear-cut answer at all. And then the last word, is research, like we need much more research into this topic. Yeah, it isn't original, you're like, well, but that's what we should do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the fourth uh, one is yeah. when you are worried about your health, go to the GP. Yeah, yeah. right. Thank yes. you. Yes. Well, do <laughs> that. Well, I want to thank all my guests. I want to thank Elle. I want to thank Nijgen van Ditmar, the Bali, and there will be a book sale, and Sarah will sign if you're up to it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, let's all discuss this further at the bar. Thank you very much nice. for this evening.